Welcome to this episode from the Digital Audio Lecture Series. We are uh, doing the audio industry. We have Joe Barisi in with us today from California and at his home. So we're really, really uh, excited to have you here and uh, to be able to go through some questions and ask some questions from our students to you about your uh, sprawling career through the uh, the audio industry and wh what it is that you do. Uh, I don't really think that you need that much of an introduction because I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of what you do, but I ask this question every single time because it's fun to hear in your own words. What is it that you do for a job? I like to call it professional babysitting. That's kind of what it is now. Psychology. Um, I don't know, man. You know, it's try to inspire people. That's really what you. I think that's what my job is to try to exude confidence and inspire people. How about that? That's a great answer. So, in this psychology and exuding confidence and performances out of people, how did you decide that this was the career path that you wanted to take? Um, well, I always wanted to be a guitar player in a band. I think that's where you start. And then I had a friend named Mike Little. He was like the killer guitar player in my neighborhood growing up. And he would like be the guy that turned me on to like the cool guitar players like Al Viola and Larry Carlton. Um, his band was going to do an eight track recording. So I went along and helped lug his gear and sat on the other side of the glass. And that was the first introduction to me to what you know multi-track recording was and 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 more so how creative it was on the other side of the glass even though i didn't have to be you know in the room playing i could still be involved in music and and be creative so that that was kind of the the starting point for me like okay that. with that starting point i mean that's pretty similar to how i got started as well but with that starting point how did you start developing skills what was your career path after that point and how long did it take you to get before you didn't grow up in california in california now but how long did it take and what was your path up to california well i mean even after that i still wanted to be a guitar player so i wanted to come out to california and go to git because all the guitar player magazines that i read you know about GIT and learning how to play guitar, be the ultimate guitar player, or, or just be a better musician, period. So um, at some point, I decided after high school not to go to college, and I worked and played guitar and studied. I wanted to really know more about music theory, so then I started taking, then I went to college, and I started taking music theory classes and playing classical guitar. And um, at some point, a year and a half into the University of South Florida, I decided to not go to GIT, even though I auditioned and got accepted. I decided to go to the University of Miami and study classical guitar with a guy named Juan Mercadal, who was just a phenomenal guitar player. And at the same time, they had a music, um, what do they call it, a music engineering program. So I thought maybe I'd learn some shit about music engineering and play classical guitar and, you know, at least have some sort of formal education in case my my delusions of grandeur of being a, in a rock band or whatever failed, which they have. Um, so that, that was, I finished a four-year program in three years, and then I had a year and a half at USC, and then I came out for an AES show, and then I basically went home and didn't do my internship. Never officially graduated. I just said, fuck it, I'm moving to California. And from that point, I'd say it was a good five years of hustling and fixing guitars and working as a tech at a studio because I could take some shit apart and, uh, and freelance assisting, kind of. I never really wanted to get tied into a studio and just be stuck there. I just wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. I was an avid reader magazines, books, just information hog, everything that I could possibly do. And it wasn't as easy as, as it is now. I mean, you, can, you don't even have to get on the internet. All you have to do is say, you know, I like alkaline water. Before you know it, your targeted ads are alkaline water. So 
<laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So, but that that's kind of where it came from. And that's where I ended up in California. And at some point, I was working on a record, and somebody fired their engineer. And we were the guy who moves into place, and the rest is here we are. The rest is here we are. You, uh, I mean, right now you have your own studio, Joe's House of Compression. I've been out there. It's a it's a very nice facility. Um, it was uh, very just overwhelming being there. Um, you've got equipment stacked everywhere, and you've got a ginormous patch bay. You learned all the processes, not just how to record, but you learned repairs, you've learned modifications, you've learned the wiring. And that you said, is that from that reading or is that you wanting specific knowledge and going and finding a mentor on that specific subject? I mean, my, my first official studio job moving to California was working at Cherokee Studios as a tech. I mean, they were, they were building, um, I wasn't fixing gear for sessions. I didn't have that kind of skill, but I could solder. So they had me in a back room wiring a range modules, but I didn't want to be a maintenance guy or a technician. I wanted to be an engineer. So my day started at 9 AM, but I would talk to the techs who did alignments and fixed gear and said, Hey, do you mind if I come in here at seven in the morning and just tag along and watch you do stuff for two hours every day? before I actually go to work. And then if you need a hand when I'm done and you're still here, I'll stay after my five o'clock, nine to five job. And they were totally cool with it. So I, I would literally every day for months, get up 6 a.m., drive to Hollywood from wherever I was living, like in LA traffic, and basically watch guys online tape machines and fix gear and ask stupid questions. And that's, you know, it's, it's it, it was, it wasn't a, quote unquote mentorship it was more like i'm willing to do whatever it takes and i don't have to get paid and i'll stay out of your way if i can just absorb some knowledge and maybe ask you a question later and that's kind of i mean it, honestly it's not anything that i had learned in college which was kind of fucked up excuse my english i mean you take a class in engineering and it's a high dollar studio you know there's an mci console and tape machines and gear and but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it wasn't really like geared towards, hey, this is how to align a tape machine, this is how to record, and this is levels. And it was more like, go for it. Here's your here's your nine-hour block you can book out once a month or whatever. I was using other people's time and just bringing bands in and trying to learn as much as I could, basically sleeping as much as I sleep now, four hours a day. You go, go, go. Burning it from both ends still, huh? Still doing it, but now it's because my dog wakes up at six. So, <laughs> got to go get that walk in. Yeah, yeah. So then, as far as what you're doing, getting to this point, working in all these studios, sticking around, putting in the extra effort, which I I think is a key point here that people are learning. You you had the desire, so you you wanted the knowledge. You basically paid a price to get the knowledge that you wanted by sticking around longer, giving it those hours. Um, what's your least favorite aspect of what you're doing and then contradict that with some of the, the, the highlights of what you're doing? I mean, honestly, I can't really complain, although I will. I mean, to be able to go to work and shorts and a t-shirt, you know, bring my dog with me sit around and create music like if you think about the global picture of it it's it's a pretty cush job it's it's a pretty great thing i mean i'm not saving the world or anything you know there's no there's no i'm not making any medical breakthroughs over here but you know my friend used to laugh and go all you do is turn the volume up and down what kind of job is that and i'm like i don't know something pretty lucrative so <laughs> you know um, so i shouldn't complain but you know you know last night it's midnight and i'm like yeah by the time i get home and feed the animals and go to bed it's going to be one or two and then i have to get up at six again and start this all over and it you start getting into that seven eight nine ten days in a row thing and it's the hours are 
are grueling. You know, I mean, I've I've done records where I've worked 120 hours in eight days. It's just out of control stuff where you just you never leave. You take one shower. You know, it's just brutal because there's a deadline that's never really existing anyway. But um, so the so the hours suck, and and it also comes down to your dedication, man. You know, I, honestly, I I I never like I've always had to support family and and work and live in California and support myself. So, and being self-employed, you just, it's not like having a nine to five and a guaranteed paycheck. So it's a supreme hustle. And you go through those bouts of, am I, am I ever going to work again? Now I've got too much work, you know, and then, and it, it's, it's, it's mentally fatiguing sometimes too. You go through these bits of depression as well. I was actually just dealing with something with a friend of mine is going through the same thing. And I just took a photo of a book that I read during my period of like disillusionment and my fourth midlife crisis or whatever it was. And, you know, and I was like, I'm going to just send him the book and just say, check this out because in this, in this job, it's, it, I mean, it's different. It's even worse now because everybody can make music, but you know, back then it's, it still sucked. Yeah. So what, what do you do now? Um, to make sure and ensure that you have your personal, you know, health and, and stay mentally clear and focused. What, what are some of the things that you do outside of audio, you know, work that help you stay, uh, with that jubilant vibe of, I like working. I like doing this. Well, I, I will say the dog is really a savior having the ability to just leave for, you know, 20 minutes, she's still walking five, six miles a day, which is incredible. So take an hour break in the morning before I go to work and we walk and then, you know, twice during the day. And, and, and if you're in the middle of an overdub or something, it gets a little hairy, but usually a band needs a break from me as well. So at some point I'm like, Hey, I got to walk the dog between two and three or whatever. And so that, that does help. I mean, you know, eating better, you know, I've never been into drugs or anything like that, so I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. I don't like to, um, you know, I don't even really drink anymore. I'm fine. I, I enjoy non-alcoholic beer just as much, and I'm always ready to do whatever. And I, you know, it's just so try to get some rest. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, like, it's not like I'm doing grueling labor. You know what I mean? I always, when I do some grueling labor, like I had a refrigerator leak, and I started you know, helping my friend do some tile and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, th those are jobs where I just go, man, this person is really, you know, physical every day. And I just sit on my ass all day. So I really can't complain. Yeah. I, uh, I, I tried to ask that question with a lot of people um, because we get students that go through that same thing, the burnout, everybody gets into a point where in their career, especially like you said, with self-employment. And if that's the route they go, you get too much work and then no work. And then it's always this funny yo-yo and, and maintaining your mental health. What you said about walking, um, interestingly enough, that's like what the Roman emperors always did to help keep their mind clear. So just uh, just a, a cool connection there to uh, mental health is a walk. So yeah, I mean, there's a, a woman, like when you have a dog, you get to know pretty much every person in your neighborhood. But there's there's a woman who walks her dog in my neighborhood, and she's in her 90s. And she looks great. And I always say to her, and when we chat, she's hard of hearing now. But when we do talk, she's got some really good jokes and stuff. And I, I just always I used to ask her, what is the key? And she said, don't stop moving. And... I'm like, that's it. It really is. Cause my, my dog is 13 and she's all gray, but she's, she's fit still. She's, there are other things going on with her, but the, the fact that she still walks every day is keeping her alive. I think so. Maybe it's keeping, she's keeping me alive too. Who knows? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's a great relationship that you've got there and to be able to do that and have something and someone that you're able to enjoy doing that with is also very important um as you got to the point where you're at who are some of your um professional or creative influences that helped kind of guide you down the path to where you're at now there's really um honestly two guys that 
changed the way I think about music. And the first one was Jason Cassaro, who has since passed. He he um if you look at his resume, he changed the way everything sounded. He was like the guy who wasn't afraid, you know, to do anything. He did he recorded Super Unknown. He uh he made the power station record where they were slowing down the tape machine to 15 IPS and doing mutes on the console because it wasn't Pro Tools then. You couldn't literally cut noise out, you know, stuff like that. He was using a Publis on uh, Infernal Machine to detune toms so they had rings and resonance to them. So having that kind of ability to make records that sound super unique he was he was definitely one of the big ones and he also would hire me to engineer for him sorry that's a landline um also um old guys have landlines so um the other guy was garth richardson and garth, garth richardson really gave me a break man he he was he had just done rage against the machine he worked at sound city quite a bit i worked at sound city as a assistant um he would try to find bands and bring them in and develop them. And, and, you know, basically the guy that normally would assist him there couldn't be bothered to work for free on a demo. And I would, I was like, dude, I would do it. I would chomp, you know, I was chomping at the bit to get into a room with a professional and no one knew rage against the machine was at the time. He was just Garth Richardson to me, you know, an engineer worked with Michael Wagner who did a bunch of records that I liked as well. Um, so I worked a couple of days, I think it was four days for free on a demo. Next record comes along and he's like, well, hey, I want you to be my assistant here now, not the other guy. And I can give you an extra hundred dollars a day if you can engineer for me. And I was like, I wasn't making a hundred dollars. I was making five bucks an hour then. The only reason I make a hundred dollars a day is because I'd be working insane hours, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, that's not, it's pretty close to the truth, but 20 hour days. Most mostly like fifteen hour days. So, well, that's that's awesome. Um, with uh, with with those you've mentioned already, some some you know powerhouses from the from the nineties that obviously blew up and, and went really big. But with with your work and your um your clientele that you've been able to work with, what are some of the coolest gigs or clients you've been able to work with? I mean, usually they're all pretty cool. You know, when you when you think about a lot of times it's it's not like a it's not like a frat party. That's what most people I think's misconception is like, oh, we're in the studio. Woohoo. You know, it's it's work and it's you know, you're you're psychologically assessing every situation and is this the right time to do this part? Is is this the right sound? Is this, you know, so, uh, you know, they all start out fun. Usually the faster ones are the funner ones because there is no time. There is no money. And they're like, I got enough time, for, you know, enough money for three days. Okay, we're making a whole record in three days. Let's do it. And those are the ones that turn out better than you think because you didn't really have time to think about it. And then and then there are ones that are just monumental that you do get to take time on. And there's only occasionally a couple that are, are whacked, you know. And then, and those usually stem from the fact that you get a demo and it's incredible. And then you see the band in a rehearsal room before you start making a record. And you're like, huh, who played on your demo? <laughs> you know, I mean, as soon as Pro Tools came in and every guy could be an editor, then I'm like, I think I've just been duped here. <laughs> oh, man. That's funny because they're, they're all editing their own tracks and making them sound good. Now you got to yeah. recreate that magic somehow. Yeah, I mean it's kind of it's kind of crazy, man. I mean, honestly, if a band was local, I'd just say see you later anyway. But when a band comes from out of town and they've taken that time to fly to California and work with you, and then you get them in a room and you can't play a bar in time, it's just what do you do? You at that point, you try to make it the best it can be, or you walk. I mean, you know, it's just at that point, I've walked off a lot of records. I've been fired off a lot of records, so I just the way it is volatile i'm volatile <laughs> yeah i i've i've told the story a little bit be, um the the first time i met you we and we've talked about it since but 
my first recollection hearing your name was from a band called fair to midland and their first album had all this like super delicate intricate you know stuff laid through it and then uh, the second album arrows and anchors came out and it was just this massive wall of sound that was just an assault and the one track that i brought up in particular was ricky ticky tabby and i asked how on earth did you get that performance from darrow the singer uh and the story i love it but would you share that with us well i mean first of all i'm going to say that the i'm not fully responsible for the way it sounds i mean they were writing heavier stuff and their demos were really good um but um it was strenuous um getting getting a performance you know for whatever reason and he was really kind of stressing out and tearing like he would like losing hair and stuff like that and just like you know just maybe nervous and um also i you know i'm i'm, I'm not like a, a yes man so when he would do the stuff with his throat which is unique and cool but a lot of times like you know i didn't get it at the time i was just like you know it's just taking away from what i would grasp onto so i think when we put that song up he was just so frustrated at that point that he he blasted it out in one take it was the most insane performance ever and that was really the turning point because like making records a lot of times this the singer gets the the end of the rope everybody takes so much longer to make their own parts together and then all of a sudden like hey hey i know there's only two days left but you got to sing 10 songs you know and that that psychological mind fuck of a singer performing that that almost makes it worse because you know they probably could do it but the fact that you're thinking i've got two days to do this or whatever so um, i like to get them involved earlier and then we you know getting him in there that really was a turning point and, and got him involved and, and i mean they're they're a killer band man the bass playing the keyboard player the drummer all of it man the guitar player was playing crazy stuff that was like it was so intricate that I actually made him break the parts down in half. I make him play the low strings in one pass and the high strings on another pass. Cause, and I'd never done that before, but I'd never seen a guy who could stretch his hands like, you know, 10 frets before either. I'm right. like, and it wouldn't be perfect every time, but I wanted it to be perfect. So I'm like, let's do the highs, let's do the lows. And he had such a great sound too. He was using nailer amps. They were, they were ahead of their time. Honestly, I just think they had a, a bad deal record wise yeah sometimes you know i i mean i still listen to that album when i'm at the gym all the time because that that will pump my adrenaline up pretty high like yeah. ricky Dicky is a great song to squat to <laughs> so one take i just remember looking up at him and going it was almost like a demon came out of his mouth it was incredible and that really was like you know at the end of it there was a little smile and then i knew he had turned, you know, at that point. There's because you just need you need those little moments where that one little bit of positivity. I mean, a lot of times when you get, you know, notes when you're mixing and stuff, it's always like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. But if you start off with, hey, this is really good, and then this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, it's never a shitty, you know, you get the psychologically, you know, this is a really good part you're doing here it's just not quite there yet that's way better than do it again or that sucks do it again or whatever so yeah that's a that's a great story i i've always enjoyed that one because um i remember yeah listening to that when they came out and then when they came through salt lake here and i got to interview them and talk to them about that and then it was like man your sound and they were and, and it was cliff i remember him just looking straight at me and saying it was evil Joe Barisi. And I was like, who's this evil Joe guy, you know? And and that's when I first like, Oh man, he's worked on a lot of stuff I've listened to, but um, that he's was evil. like the, you got to go check out who this guy is. And at that point I was like, all right, I need to meet you at some point in my career and talk to you specifically about this. Cause it was a very interesting point for me, but you've worked on so many albums and every time, um, I, I hear a podcast or read something. Everybody talks about, well, we could do all this stuff digitally, but he made us do it 
analog. Will you talk about the mindset that you get in and how you coach the performers to do stuff and stretch their boundaries in that way? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it's not like a pre-planned thing, you know? I mean, sometimes, sometimes you put a mic in front of somebody and it comes out and you're like, okay, we're done. And, and sometimes it's a bit more challenging. So, I mean, you know, a lot of times it's just getting somebody out of their comfort zone. Like I remember when I, when I was like, this is a, I've told this story before, but when I was working on um, Soundgarden, King Animal, I had asked Chris to play uh, a solo if he wanted to play a solo on a song. And he's like, ah, Kim will be down here in a couple of days because the band was on their way down. He'll do it. I'm like, okay, cool. But it was a kind of a weird tuning thing. And, you know, I was like, all right. So I came in early the next day and I put on YouTube and I had learned to play the rain song by Zeppelin in an open tuning. Cause it's done and it does it both ways. Anyway, it's in the open tuning. Um, I put the guitar in the open tuning on the corner of the couch in the studio. And Chris came in at some point and um, we're sitting there listening to some music and, he goes, what's up with that guitar? You know, and I'm like, oh, it's in this weird open G tuning or whatever. So, you know, it's like the rain song, and I just give him a little snippet of it, and he goes, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Put the guitar down. Like, so you know, the guitar's in his hand. It's mic'd up already, obviously, and ready to go. And then I change over the Pro Tools session to the song that needs the solo. And I'm like, hey, I'm just kind of gonna work on this for a second. And put him in the chord, and before you know him, he's a freaking guitar solo. So. You know, there's a part that comes out. So it's not really pushing the boundaries. It's kind of like trying to, you know, foster creativity, I guess. But, you know, and, and sometimes, well, I mean, it's, it's actually weirder now because, like, a lot of times a band will do demos and because it's digital and you get to live with it for a year and you pretty much think it's the greatest thing you've ever written. And then I get in there and I'm like, maybe this part's not so great, you know? So, you know, I mean, it's back in my day, we'd never had demos like that. It was a four track and you basically just spit it out. And they're like, okay, it'll be cooler when we get back into the studio and when we can actually perform it. I mean, you weren't married to it as much, but right. the ability to make music that is incredible now, easily with a focus right interface and, uh, and some free software and, it's actually, it's good and bad. You know, the good part of it is, is it, you know, there are a lot of creative people that wouldn't have the ability to, to do that. And now they do. So it's awesome. And it also means there's a lot of shit out there too. Yeah. It, um, I know in their, uh, tracks podcast, Avenged Sevenfold talked about the solo cup, uh, microphone is what they called it. Uh, they also Perfect. talked about the, uh, headset from the, uh, from the uh, military helicopter, you've got a lot of cool different types of mics and things that you use. Um, is that to help people get into mindset? Is that just because yeah. let's just try this out? Sure. I mean, like most people would go, okay, I want a filtered vocal. So they go, okay, let's, you know, I remember mixing a, a song for a band and everything was cut on this most expensive U47 microphone, but everything was processed with a plug-in to sound like it was lo-fi and i'm like why not just use a fucking lo-fi mic then i mean isn't it way cooler to put something kind of shitty sounding that might look cool in front of you that might inspire a performance then you know that it just never made sense to me so when when we were looking for interesting weird vocal sounds for that record my friend keith from uh he was in a band called buck cherry he's like a really great guitar player a friend of mine and does a lot of recording and production and he had given me this pig nose PA and it's basically a speaker with a little microphone that sticks out of it. And they're, they're kind of hard to find. I'm not even really sure where he found it, but he gave it to me and I'm like, let's check this thing out, man. And it's a plug mat into it. And instantly he was like in love with it because it looked cool as hell and it was totally unique. And then, you know, then we modified a little with the solo cup, which the same sort of thing I did on Adam Jones when we did talk box to put the talk, put the solo cup around the microphone to just focus the vocal out of coming out of the mouth to make the talk box sound more unique than just a generic tube sticking out of your mouth. 
Yeah, that's uh, I'm I I love listening through the stuff that you've produced and created because there's always really fun textures in there that I know when you listen to it, it's not oh well, that was created with this plugin. It becomes more of a how on earth did they create that sound and uh, some of it is plugins though. I right. mean that's I used to be anti digital for a long time but now i just embrace it and I, I i bought more crap on black friday that's digital than i did analog i mean honestly it just the tools are getting better it's just how you use the tool you know well i don't have a problem with with any of it you know I, it's just to me sorry you're right to me a, a lot of it is um is i don't know it's just easy to use the plugin so you tend to generically do the same thing every time like when you slap the compressor on it's the same freaking compressor so you know for me why not use a you know if i use the plug and i'll use different compressors learn to learn, learn, learn what to do you know yeah yeah um with with your with your career what um what have you learned like in the school of hard knocks that you could help our students maybe learn and avoid pitfalls uh, that you've been able to work yourself out of? I mean, I'm, I'm an advocate of knowledge at all times and not just music knowledge, but you know, I used to go to the, I remember, I can remember the day I went to Barnes and Noble and looked at self-help books. Cause I'm like, how do I help myself be more positive? How do I help conversations? You're in a room with somebody you're trying to be creative and try to be inspiring. So you have to figure out ways to like read their personalities. So there's so many other aspects than learning how to be fast with quick keys. So, I mean, I, I, I learn that stuff. I, I read magazines and, you know, I might wake up in the morning and after I walk the dog, I might flip open bass player magazine and read one little article where somebody said they used the blah, blah, blah and a blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, oh, I never even thought about that. Let me try that today. And that's maybe it didn't work today either, but it's in the back of my brain is it's this is a possibility of something I never even heard of or whatever. You know, so you have to kind of, you know, back in the day when when, when there were studios and multiple bands and multiple facilities and you're walking down the hallway and you heard something you're like hey what is that man that's a really great guitar sound you got going on there what are you playing to and then you learn that way but nowadays you don't see anybody i mean right now when you're in a in a room teaching kids that aren't even in a class in front of you you know what i mean it's 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 so remotely remote it's that you have to to, to stay current or inspired you have to form these communities where you can be, get feedback off your friends. Hey man, listen to my mix. What do you think? Is it shit? Is it cool? What do you hate about it? What are you doing? You know, I started this thing called the Sunday Night Music Club out here for a while where I just invited people to hang out and talk shop. Because how would I know what the cool plugin is if I don't know, you know, somebody using it? Like, that's why I just asked you about your guitar and your microphone and stuff. I'm like, it's cool. Right. Your voice sounds really good on that mic and SM7 suits you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I got, you know, just just as a side note, I do have a fun mic. Um, if I wanted to change the voice to uh, something a little bit off, uh, copper, can... copper mic. Yeah the uh, the the Placid Audio copper phone. Yeah, um, I was actually looking into that thing, man, when we were when we were doing events because I was looking for weird ways that Matt might be able to take that shit live. Right, and I started all kinds of you know, down, down the rabbit hole stuff with throat mics. And I don't even know how many throat mics I built and they all blew up and just stuff like that. Just, yeah. That, that one's fun for uh, some interesting sounds. And I'm sure you know the story about these things in LAX, right? They shut down LAX because somebody took these through, had one of these and they thought it was a pipe bomb. So. Uh, excellent, man. Right. Let's hear Can we plug that in? Can we hear uh, I would, it would ha probably make a lot of popping. I can mute my mic and plug it back in in a second. Let me, I'll, I'll mute. Let me, give me a second. Um, while I do that though, tell us where you see yourself in like the next five to 10 years with your career path. I'm, I'm 58 years old. So if I'm alive in 10 years, you know, I'm not really sure what is happening. I mean, 
there's certain physical things that happen to a man as you get older. I've listened to a lot of loud music in my life. And um, I don't know, man. I mean, Andy Wallace is still doing great work. He's 75. I, I, I'm not really sure, man. All right, here I come back in with the copper mic. And I don't hear the difference because I'm not piping my own voice into my ears. But you guys, what? how does it sound to you guys? It sounds awesome. Yeah? Yeah. Telephony. Will yeah, I, chat says telephony, so. Yeah, it's, it's cool, man. Yeah, and, and that's one of those things you can just grab and plug something in and different, just like you were saying. And I was like, you know, let's just pull this thing out. And I'm glad that you said, uh, let's do it. So, because I normally probably wouldn't have. But um, I mean, I would probably try to find a copper element or an old telephone, which is even harder to find these days and wire it to an XLR. Right. Because then you're like, hey, sing into this, you know, and but that is just as inspiring to me because it sounds cool and it looks different. If that looked like an SM57 and sounded like that, I probably wouldn't have plugged it in. Right. Yeah. And they're saying do some guttural stuff. I'm not <laughs> going to scream into the microphone. <laughs> not right now, but um, I'm also going to switch it back because I don't want to hold it the whole rest of the time. Uh, uh, they got a new one out. I think it has a bass switch on it too. It gives you more bottom end. Do a pig squill. <laughs> Don't know how that sounds through there. So students are all egging me on in the chat, which is great. I, I, I know, I'm watching them now, man. I just I, I can see at least six people now I'm cruising through. Oh, I see more than six. What's up, everybody? I'll show you the. Let's go to the other view. You can see. Some of the students are um, with Tanner. Tanner, raise your hand. You can see a bunch of them are in our, we call that Studio B. That's uh, that's our like almost <laughs> anechoic chamber there. Um, the, it's it's so dead that that's where we do Foley and ADR and all that fun stuff. Uh, Tanner's cool. usually in our control room, but I think with more students, they put it up on the big screen TV in that room. And then you can see other students kind of all around. Gareth's a, actually an alumni. He's in Atlanta. Travis looks like he might be at home. Will looks like he might be at home. Thomas looks like he's at the in the old library, and that's the area up above our uh, our studio there. Um, Chris looks like he's at home. Wiz, another professor, looks like he's at home. Owen right there is a, another professor in our program, and he looks like he's in our back room yep he's in the he's in the storage room behind our classroom arlen is another professor he looks like he's at home zach somewhere on campus i can tell with that glass wall behind him john kim is somewhere on campus Corey hooker is a an alumni probably walking his dogs out somewhere uh dawson oh, yeah. he's somewhere by zach and we got alex probably at home and people all over the place and like you said yeah this is a class that I figured was easier to do not in a classroom so that we can have this interaction. We can all see your face. You can see our faces and we can, uh, we can easily just pipe in our, um, <laughs> our questions where we need them. I'm flexing my knowledge of what there, Zach, of where everyone watches from. Yep. Yep. I've got, I'm, I'm spying on all you guys. I, I go memorize where you're all at, but um, so this is, you know, part of the people in our program. I don't know how many t people Tanner's got in there with them. Cause like it's small and fun, but there's probably a dozen people in there at least. So yeah, we, uh, we, we, that's the nice thing about technology. We can, yeah. you can be in California. Like I said, Gareth can be out over there in Atlanta and I can be here in Utah and we can be wherever we need to be and have, have a good good fun time and record big brother <laughs> yes i constantly know where you all are I, I like that you guys yeah i'm I'm always spying on you it's my job um all right well back. let's repeat all you guys yeah what advice would you give to our students as uh, they learn to embark on this own on their own personal journey towards becoming an audio professional we tell them that in their senior year, we tell them you are you need to start calling yourself an audio professional, less of a student. What are some tips and advice that you would give to these guys as they're in this path? I mean, you got to kind of 
I always say to everybody, no one's knocking on my door. You bring the door to them. So if you're going to sit on the couch and watch some Netflix with a girlfriend or your wife or whatever partner and cry that you're not working, then, or are you going to go to the local club and see a band and, you know, do whatever you can, work, work free in a local studio, or whatever. I mean, you really do have to make your own path happen. No one's, no one's knocking on my door. No one ever knocked on my door. I'm the guy who always said, Zach, can I work two hours free in the morning and learn how to align the tape machine? Blah, blah, blah. Can I go to repair guitars at a guitar store so I can learn more about the instrument, which, you know, made it so that I could intonate and repair guitars when you're making guitar, you know, you're doing guitar parts in a session. So, um, you know, things like that. It's just do 100% at all times. Very, very quick lesson here. A friend of mine um, at one point, you know, um, took a job and, and it wasn't quite the money that he was used to making. And I walked into the studio just to go check up on him. And um, and he's in the lounge playing video games. And I'm like, so what are you doing? And he's like, well, you know, I got half the money, so I'm kind of doing half the work. And I'm like, really? So now you're making me look like an asshole for recommending you. And you're never going to get hired again. And you're never going to get hired from any of those people they're talking to. So, so do, do the job 100% regardless if you ask for a dollar or a million dollars. I love that. That's great. That's such, I don't think there's any better advice that anybody could give than that because you never know where people are going to go. You never know where word of mouth gets you. And we talk a lot uh, this semester about the power of the network and yeah. it's through the I power mean, of the network. I met you. Uh, it's through the, yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is in a hospital. You know, I was going, Hey, this is a world renowned surgeon. This is a guy that fucking turns faders up and down. Who gives a shit really? But if they enjoyed working with you. Well, I'm, I'm going to turn the time over now to our students uh, and to anybody else that might have questions for you and let them kind of run the, and of course, hands go up right away and that's great. Let them kind of run some questions to you. Uh, John, you were, your hand was up first. So go ahead and ask your question. You're muted, John. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Hi, Hi Joe. Um, How are you? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for asking. Um, there was an article you were interviewed for about 15 years ago with Sound on Sound. And uh, in the article, you mentioned that you like to set up three room mics when you're tracking drums, uh, one a stereo pair and one in mono. I was curious how you use uh, the three uh, tracks you get from that. Um, well, the, I mean, that's a good question. So I, sometimes it's more, it's usually at least three, but uh, you know, when you're, when you're mixing a lot of times, it's interesting. If you have that stereo room going, you, you might not want stereo room the whole time, maybe in a verse where something gets kind of stripped down, you're pushing up that stereo room where you can hear it. But maybe when the chorus gets bigger and fatter, you don't want a stereo room anymore. Maybe you want a mono room or maybe you want to push those rooms in your mix to create some excitement. So that's that they're kind of like, especially with the digital realm now where there's no, you know, limit to tracks. I could record, you know, I, I usually bust stuff together anyway, but I still might put three, four, five room mics up. Sometimes it's always a talkback mic that's sitting in a room that always sounds great. So I'm, I'm not saying I use them at all times, but, you know, sometimes just in mixes, same thing. It's just, this will come up in the verse in mono, or this will fill out the guitar sound on the right side in the verse, something like that. So it's just, there, there are mix elements that I can pick and choose where I'm using them. Nice. Travis, go ahead. Hello. Hi. What's up, um, man? I'm just, you know, living the dream. Uh, I call it living the lie. That's my- Living the lie? Name. Nice. Yeah. I, I usually follow that up with nightmares or dreams too, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> um, so like you mentioned, like working with Chris Cornell, who's, who was one of my favorite uh, performers ever. Um, so like when you're, when you're working with, uh, 
you know, talented people. You you mentioned like you you set up like an opportunity for you know Chris to you know fiddle around with the guitar and stuff. So uh do you have any other examples of things that you've done to kind of help like present oppor- like to set up opportunities for some of the artists you've worked with to help help them kind of free up their mindset a little bit and just kind of well, open I, you know I, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So so here's an example. Um you know our, like working at studios that don't feel like you're in a hospital are is the first key. Like my studio is like my bedroom when I was 17. You know, there's pictures on the wall, there's shit everywhere. If you feel like you're going to, you know, here's, here's another example. So, all right, well, I'll, I'll continue on that one first. So like going to sound city, sound city is like a glorified rehearsal room. I think in the movie, I said, you can shit in the corner and no one would complain. That, <laughs> that is an actual, I mean, it's not something you'd want to do and it would be frowned on, but the, 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 the fact is that it's comfortable when you work there, you know, you never felt like, Oh my God, I'm paying so, so much money. And if I don't perform today or get a part, then I've just wasted that money. And then there are places where you go put down your Coca-Cola and somebody's behind you with a little mop and they're like, you know, and then you feel like you can't do anything. So, so the micromanaging part of, I mean, it, it's not a hospital. It's, it should yeah. be a creative environment. So your place should be creative and have the ability to be able to, so I, I had a, you know, have some guitars or whatever. And, and sometimes, you know, a guitar is a guitar. It looks like fucking normal, yeah. but, I had Bill Nash. Um, I played a Bill Nash, Les Paul, and he distresses them. And they're new guitars, but I'm like, can you make this, you know, make it look like it came out in 1959? So I had this Bill Nash. It's a 2003 or 2007 Les Paul. It's maybe a $2,000 guitar that he distressed and made it look like repainted it or antiqued it and made it look badass. It looks like, uh, literally looks like it's from 1959. And I put it in there and people see it and they're like, Oh my God, this thing looks incredible. It's so old. And then, and then when they finally play a guitar part, I'm just like, Hey, they think came like 20 years ago. You know what I mean? It's, it's not old at all. So yeah. inspire somebody, you know, that's another example of, of inspiration. Yeah. Um, you know, building a pipe bomb, like stuff like that is, just, you know, it sucked. I built it for Maynard. And it sucked. It just didn't work on vocals. Didn't have enough output. But I threw it in front of a guitar amp, and I'm like, "Fuck, it's kind of cool." It's a filtered guitar sound, like that Placid Audio microphone. And, you know, it's it's way cooler than uh, going, "Hey, let me, you know, EQ the shit out of this SM57 to make it sound like this." So, you know, find one man's trash is another man's treasure. I got lots of trash, and just sometimes you just put up a weird ass speaker, and it sounds different. You know. Yeah. Sick. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. All right, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh let's get um I don't know whose hands are up first. We'll go Will Gareth and then Chris. I'm scrolling to find who's who here. Uh there's Will. All right. Yeah. Hi Joe. Nice to meet you. <clears throat> Good to meet you too. Uh so your studio is called the House of Compression, right? Yes. Um, so I was just gonna kind of ask maybe some general tips and then more specific stuff about compression. Uh, what's your secret sauce depending on genre you know less is more or do you slam stuff how much do you do individual track versus bus based once you get to your final mix i mean honestly i always say the fader is the poor man's compressor you know what i mean i would do that i would ride a vocal before i squeeze the shit out of it i find there's a, i mean i'm not a compression uh addict people ask me how much how much compression i use when i'm recording drums I'll bust two kick drum mics together and put a little compressor together or two snare mics together and, and the room mics, the toms are never compressed. The overheads are never compressed. Guitars are never compressed. They're already compressed enough coming out of the guitar amp. So it really isn't. I mean, it's kind of a, 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 a false sense of idle house of compression. It just happened to be one of those things, but but honestly, I mean, I, I really love the SSL compressor. So in my, like my mixing classes and stuff, I always have it buried as far as threshold goes, but it's on the smallest ratio possible. 
so what it does is just brings the sound a little bit forward and um it's just uh to me it's just because the ssl every compressor has a sound so once you learn what they sound like you might not even use it to be a compressor you might just use it to be the sound so some things do get pummeled usually you try to unpummel them later on you can always re-pummel but you can't unpummel so I would say a little goes a long way. And, and a lot of things is, you know, don't be afraid of it though. Like getting people's tracks to mix where they're afraid of compression on a vocal. And then I have to sit here and listen to it and try to like put triple compressors on it to try to make it normal. Like sometimes you're better off learning. You've gone too far and then you learn how to back it off. And, and sometimes compression helps the performance. I mean, if a singer can't hear themselves in their headphones, then you need to compress more. You know, if they're a dynamic or you have to figure out, hey, let's cut it in sections. Let's cut the soft stuff and change the preamp level or the mic level. Back in the day with a really good singer, you could just ride the vocal level and it would be done. That's poor man's compression. That's all well, I got. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Gareth. Hey, Joe, thanks for taking time out of your day to, to talk with us. Thank you guys too. Um, question I got for you, I'm, I'm going to ask you about Pinkerton and I, I'm sure a lot of people always ask you about Pinkerton, <laughs> but, um, my question is kind of what's your approach to embracing like a uniqueness of, of quality or sound when you're working on a project, um, you know, sonically speaking, Pinkerton is really like the Weezer album. Like, I mean, it's wedged between Blue Album and Green Album, which both of which you would be considered. They, they sound, yeah, they sound great. Pinkerton is like kind of not great, although it is like it has that quality and we love it. And, and at the time when Pinkerton came out, I believe it it like wasn't super received really well. But now in hindsight, everyone's like Pinkerton is so awesome and it has this live feel at the time when you were engineering that uh you know did it did it sound awesome at the time uh how, how do you how did you yeah i guess what's your approach to just embracing like we're gonna do this and well you know. right. it's a long story but the short of it is this i love the blue album and when i got asked to go i originally was just gonna go um remix say it ain't so as the next single and unmute all the feedback that they had muted. So there are two versions of that song. You'll hear it sometimes with the feedback in it. Um, but they got um, um, Chris, fuck, I'm, I'm drawing a brain fart right now, but Chris Shaw, who did the record to remix it while I started Pinkerton in the other room. And that was the right move, in my opinion, because Chris Shaw is awesome. So, but so i'm embracing this a band wants to play live they don't want to use headphones okay it's still we're using wedges they each have their own little mix but they're in the same room together there was a lot of other weird stuff going on in the band at the time and they had just changed guitar players and they were self-producing quote unquote because they had sold a million records and that's the deal they made with their a and guy evidently um so i mean i honestly remember just just wanting to make the blue record again because it was so good and right. not, and having the opposite. So to embrace what was there, I had to tie it all together. Cause when like it, the thing about it is like, if everything's perfect, that's fine. And everything's shitty. That's fine. But when you make everything perfectly clear and shitty, it's not so good. So, the sounds themselves of a band playing loud, Matt had oranges, the guitar players had half stacks, the drums are loud, we're in an ambient room, the sound of the room's changing. Um, I was on a console that was nothing that I'd ever recorded on, a focus rise, a little bit soft. Um, still going to tape, thank God. But um, I couldn't tie it all together. And then the the turning point i've actually mentioned this story recently i was with jason casaro we went to visit a guitar player named eddie martinez we're in new york at electric lady we went to visit eddie at his house 
and I had just heard a he played with Robert Palmer. I heard Addicted to Love or one of those songs that had a really cool guitar sound. And I asked him what he was using, and he said he was using these little electro harmonics um, guitar pedals. They're called linear power boosters, and you plug them into your guitar or your amp. You know, they're super simple, one knob. But um, he's like, yeah, I got a bunch of them in a, you know shoebox in the closet you can have them because he had rack mounted all his to make them more reliable anyway he gave me the shoebox i cobbled a couple together at the studio the next day and i decided to try them out like chad blake style distorting some stuff so i distorted the room so i had these like m49s in the room capturing the whole band live and it just didn't feel right until i ran them through a pair of these 35 dollar electro harmonics linear power boosters and then i was like Fuck it. It tied it all together. We're creating a sound right now. And it was just a thick, you know, part of it was driven by the band. Like Rivers didn't want to spend a lot of time doing a ton of overdubs. When we did vocals, we went to Fort Apache in Boston. Um, we were doing vocals live. I mean, I set all three of them up in a triangle, you know, Matt, Brian and Rivers, and they sang together like old Eagles records, you know, where they would harmonize to each other. Only I had a little bit more control, three, three microphones, three guys, but the null point of the, the mic facing the other guys, but you're still hearing it. So if somebody hit a bad note, I couldn't just punch in one microphone. I'd have to punch in all three, which was kind of cool because then they'd have to play live. Like when you're punching in drums and a band has to play live, it's, it's interesting. So, I mean, honestly, it, it, you embrace it, you make it the best it could possibly be under those circumstances, and you try to push it in areas where it's still musical, and it was very musical. It, just, it was obviously a disappointment. It was, it, it was, and if I was a Blue Record fan and I heard Pinkerton, I'd be like, what is this shit? There's floor toms ringing, there's shit that's out of tune, but when you hear like a guitar solo doubled with a synth, or you hear some of the room sounds that are blown up, or some of the interesting guitar sounds. I mean, there were times where I was flying in using a harmonizer to change the pitch of the room because they decided to change a note. And because everything is bleeding live, you know, when you play a bass note that's an A, for instance, it's live in the room as well, it's an A. So if you all of a sudden you go in and you change the A to a B and it's still out of tune, you gotta figure out where it's bleeding and use a harmonizer and pitch that as well. So. But all those moments have a unique quality to them. So it, it turned into a thing, you know, and they, they also loved um, Dave Fridman. So at one point, Dave came in and took over for me at Sound City. I kind of helped him set up at Sound City because that was my home ground. And he had never worked there. And he ended up doing four songs, I believe. So and, and his whole thing was this overdriven cassette decks and tape machines. So. I mean, it kind of all tied in together. Yeah, that that is amazing about Pinkerton too. Is just like, it, for the time, I can't imagine being brought in after like the massiveness that Blue Album is, and then being like, we're gonna do something that is <laughs> just not that at all. Um, well, so I mean, it turned out to be they just wanted to do it live, and they didn't want to use headphones. So if you're gonna have that kind of volume, shit's gonna blow up. You know, I mean, honestly, I did the demos for the green record at Rivers house on a Mackie console and my only outboard gear was a big muff. So <laughs> I was using a fucking aux end with a big muff and blowing bass up and blowing drums up. And, you know, and I remember they went to the high dollar studio with Rick Ocasek and an engineer and they, they remember coming calling and going, how did you get this sound on this demo? We can't capture that energy. And I'm like, use a big muff, dude. So crazy. Yeah, great. Like, yeah, I, I guess just kind of comes probably back to the 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 ideology of just committing, you know, like. Yeah. When you're making well, it's tape also. It's a tape yeah. machine. So Twenty four tracks. You're definitely committing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Joe. You got right, it. Chris. And then we'll get uh, Corey Hooker. Awesome. Thank you. First of all, I just gotta say, you sound like you're so inspiring because this is like a real engineer, like someone that is like the commitment idea you were just talking about is, I don't know, I feel, um, I feel overly privileged to have Control Z 
I'll say that right now. <laughs> Just listening to you talk, I'm like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta commit more. I gotta be, I gotta be a little bit more scared in the studio uh, because right now, you know, scared, man. yeah, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm I still put two t- two two drum mics on one track. I mean, somebody asked me that the other day. I was like, "What are you talking about, man? I, you put the snare top and bottom on the same track?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's a fucking snare. Like, <laughs> you put them together, man, and compress it a little yeah. bit. You cue it. It's a snare. I'm mic yep. this. Why do I need separate control of two of them? I I can't honestly get that past my brain. I can't. I can't like do. I can't put an inside and an outside kick mic. I just still cannot grasp this the kick mic." No, I got to put it together. That's a kick. Well, and it totally makes sense. Like everything you're talking about is just like, man, I, I don't know. I think about this so much more engineering based and I, I love that, but really I've got two kind of short questions. Uh, one is, you know, you, you mentioned Black Friday and it's the week after. So all of us at school have been talking to each other about the plugins that we bought. It's becoming kind of a, a pseudo tradition among uh, musicians to just like spend all our money on plugins and uh, be poor for a week or two. But I got to ask you what you bought this on uh, Black Friday. What was the plugins? What were you excited about? <laughs> um, there's a, a company called Relab. Do you know those guys? I'm looking they, them up right now. They make a bunch of different reverbs. They make a, a really interesting Sonsig reverb that's cool. It had a Quantec room simulator thing in it. Um, the the one that they, they make a 480. I have a 480. I don't necessarily use it. Um, but they make one called a VRS that's like a, a TC thing, and and it's awesome. And in the back of my brain, I always remember how awesome it is. And th- this year, they came out with uh, a Quantec Room Simulator plugin, which is pretty cool, pretty realistic digital incarnation of rooms. And they also came up with a, a Masalik Stereo Bus EQ, and it is fucking really good. Um, I always look at a digital version of something that in case my outboard gear dies i have a, a fallout you know I, I have two of everything i try to have two of everything but not everything's exact it's sometimes it's nice to have that the mass lick is really good put that on your mix it's it's pretty tasty so i did buy those and i ended up buying something else recently i don't i don't honestly remember it was like maybe 29 bucks or something i mean the the other two guys were a little more expensive but they're they're worth it that's cool. No, that's a, that's awesome. I just wanted to ask that. And then the the second one was, I just I guess it comes with a with a, a thank you because um, one of my favorite parts about uh, these lectures and and a thank you to Brian too with along with this is just like you're so real. Like I think you know we've heard your name whether it be from Brian's mouth or whether it be on the internet or li- like we listening to Weezer and looking into that stuff. We've heard your name so much and it's almost like we put you on this pedestal, right? Like, and it's it, you amongst like a list of long names, one that I've been uh, trying to take off a pedestal and make a real person in my head is Rick Rubin. And a lot of the stuff that you've been saying kind of reflects a lot of the things he's been saying with bar, as far as like uh, giving it a your all and and sending it. And, and really, I love that you said like that your job is inspiring others. Um, it That really inspired me because I feel that that's what I'm good at, whether that's been inside music or, or in a lot of other places. Um, so it makes me excited to continue to work in this space and, and focus on inspiring others. But point being, I love that you were super real with us. And one thing that made you a really real human to me today was that you talked about your fourth or fifth midlife crisis. And, oh, yeah. and I, I feel like I've had this year a bit of a quarter life crisis. I mean, I can't say it's a midlife. I feel like I have no wisdom at all, but I'm I'm right there at the at 25 and it's like, okay, one fourth of the way through. Right? It's like, now what the hell am I going to do with my life? And it's like, wait, wait a second. You're only a quarter of the way through. <laughs> like you don't have to know the answer. But the point being, um, is there something, and this might not really exist. The answer to this question might not exist, but I wanted to ask, um, it seems, you know, you obviously have a lot of experience coming out of those. Um, is there something that's been similar in every upswing of your life? Something that you can like, okay, if, if shit's hitting the fan right now and things are going hard, I'm going to go back to these things. I know you mentioned like self-help books. I'm, I've read a ton. I love, um, uh, you know, thinking books. But like, is there something uh, in your life that you can kind of fall back on and you're like, when stuff's going hard, what do you do? I mean, I always remember it's like a sine wave. Sometimes you're riding the peak 
sometimes you're in the trough, but the trough always comes back to a peak. You know, it's, it's hard to see it. I have a friend going through it right now. It's hard to see it. 2017, I had a, I don't know, maybe it was my second or third. I was just like, man, music sucks. All the, all the jobs I got were like, I'm just like, I don't want to work on this shit. You know, I'd rather bag your groceries at Trader Joe's, honestly. And I don't have a problem with that. That's the thing. I don't give a shit. I'm a pretty good grocery bagger. It was my first job. And, and if you came and I was your fucking guy at Trader Joe's bagging your shit, I'd be like, Hey man, how's it going? Do you want the eggs on top or what? I, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. I love that. So, um, you have to be able to just like realize that, okay, this is, this is shit. And I, I don't care how much money they're going to pay me. I'm not going to do it. And that was a year that I decided, all right, you know, I really wanted to learn MIDI more. I wanted to get some Arturia plugins and check out some of these different synthesizers. I really wanted to like do stupid shit, like use pitch to MIDI conversion and take a guitar solo and convert all the notes to MIDI and put a synthesizer underneath it and do stupid stuff so I can push a mix up and go, this is way more interesting. And then I decided I was going to compose some music and and learn these plugins because in my mental state, I, I like to me, rough mixes are shit. I mean, they're going to mix it or not. The rough mixes are rough. I can't spend 14 days on a freaking rough mix. I don't care. I don't have that kind of like will to do that. So I basically, how am I going to learn plugins? Well, I'm not going to just sit here and put it on a kick drum and go, Oh, it's kind of cool. So I, I just started composing these like minute, minute and a half, two minute long pieces of music and created music from fucking with plugins and outboard gear. I, I bought a pedal steel guitar. I couldn't play pedal steel to save my freaking life, but I put an Ebo on it and a big muff on it and did some shit to it. And I'm like, all of a sudden now I got a freaking soundscape going on here. So I, I decided to, to make my own music that way. I put it actually kind of put two, two records out on Spotify already. And it's just noise. One's one's called evil and darkness. Five, five titles start with E five titles start with D and the next one I called ethereal and delicate. I did five more. You know, when I have a little break, that start with E, five more that start with D, and then I'm on the edgy and distorted series right now, but I just haven't had time to finish the last half a dozen songs. So they're not really songs. They're just experiments in sound. But it was fun. And that's how I got through 2017. I was like, I'm going to be a poor motherfucker this year, and that's fine. I don't care, because if, if, if I need to get money, I don't really have a problem going to Home Depot or whatever, I, you know. There is no ego really when it comes down to it. That, it's mentally, your mental happiness is more important. So, man, preach! I, what you just said right there is so gold. There is no ego when it comes down to it. Forget the ego. And like the last thing you want to do is be learning how to use this shit in front of somebody. You know what I mean? Like, so, so if you decide, like, the, the part of having your own place is that on my day off, I'm experimenting with 18 direct boxes. I'll call my friends up and go, hey, man, bring over every SM57 you own and let's test them all out. And we'll just reamp signals through and just test shit out in the most scientific of ways so you can learn, hey, the SM7 is way better than the SM7B or the SM7A or whatever, you know, just stupid shit. So, but those are, those are your, it's like learning. It's like going to school. Continue. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Here. All right. Uh, hey, Joe, thank you for, uh, you know, sharing your time with us today. I think you're fucking badass, and you produce some of my favorite albums of all time. Oh, um, I mean, me- music is like, to me, it's such a universal language. I mean, I mean, I love what you said about riding the sine wave of life. Like, that just <laughs> that struck a chord with me. But I guess I think you're just such a real guy. So I just want to know, like, the like, what was like i want to know like three of your favorite all-time albums like first one i want to know is like what was your most like influential or favorite album growing up um what's the favorite album you've ever produced or worked on and then what is like your current favorite that you uh are listening to or you know that you are you know everybody's sharing their Spotify rap from the whole year right now. So it's like, I, I love seeing the music that people enjoy because it kind of gives you a window into their soul, right? So I'm just kind of curious, like what your 
favorite album growing up is, what the, your favorite work is, and then just like what's your favorite album right now. All right. Well, I mean, growing up, I was really into the, the Beatles and the Stones, but the most influential record to me growing up was the first Boston record. And that, that's probably the reason I started doing this because I was walking the tightrope of wanting to be a musician or wanting a real job. So I was yeah. like, and, and realizing that Tom Schultz was a brain and went to MIT and was, you know, uh, responsible for the Polaroid one step camera, which is for all your times, but, um, he recorded and wrote and played pretty much, you know, the first Boston record, which sold 16 million copies and had great songs on it. And at the same time, he was a musician and he also, he, he went to school and learned stuff. So that was really the biggest, um, the start or the, or the one that actually made my career path justifiable. Um, I love that. Yeah, great album. Um, my favorite record that I produced, I don't know, I'm going to say just on a, on a complete whim, Stoner. I didn't produce Stoner Witch, but it was probably one of my favorite experiences making a record by the Melvins. And purely because it was 17 days, we made the record in 14 there was no rules like one of the guys was his first gig as an assistant in the studio he was the third not the second and garth made him dress up in an elvis outfit when he was in the room <laughs> so that so there's this guy who was you know a super nice kid very quiet but he's dressed as elvis the whole time and that's hilarious Stuff like every time you'd walk into the room, the door would creak. So we'd record the door creaking and use that. Garth's dog would <laughs> we'd tickle his belly and put a mic next to his mouth and run it through harmonizers. And, and that would be the intro to a song. Or I got really into detuning and harmonizing the rooms, courtesy of Jason Cassaro, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and th those guys were in anything, man. I was taping crystal mics to, to straps. You know, and using the crystal mic as a contact mic on a pick guard on a guitar, and and that's a guitar sound. It was just so unorthodox. Just um, and whatever you want to do, they were into it, and they can all play, which was incredible. So there was no struggle there. It took longer to get a sound than it did for them to play the part. So I'm gonna say that was probably my my favorite record to make. But there, there, what, which one was that again? I didn't hear what you said at first. What, what was it uh, called? Stoner Witch. Stoner Witch. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then what am I into now? Like, I don't know. It's just, you know, when I hear stuff on the radio now or on satellite, it all sounds so fucking generic and the same because everybody's got the same EQ curve and the same everything. But when I hear stuff like you know lorna shore or stuff like that where i just go this shit's off the hook i heard a, a demo from a band yesterday actually that blew my mind and i'm gonna look who it is because they just did their first tour and they're 16 to 18 year old kids and it's fucking awesome i mean it had a sound to it there's a girl in the band who plays bass i believe and sings and she sounds like like they sound like the pretenders but they have this kind of compacted mid range that's really like just interesting and different. Um, let me just see here. That's awesome. Uh, I totally when you find that, will you send that to Brian so he can share it with me? <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now as soon as I figure out where it came from. Because um, I'm in front of my computer. I'll do a quick little search. came from him the band's called speed of light speed of light yeah it's just speed of light.com speed of light band.com but man I, I mean they have barely played any shows there if she just opened up for bad religion evidently i just found out about this yesterday and he goes hey man they're looking for some feedback and i'm like i'll listen to it and i go it's unique it sounds cool man and they're they can play three piece and the boat there's like I don't know if it's two brothers that look similar to me. 
and the girl and that and it sounds like more than one person sings i've not seen them live but there is a youtube clip somewhere that of their first full set um their ninth show ever on their first u.s tour opening for bad religion but it was it was pretty damn cool man i mean it's you know i, I like stuff it's just a little left to center um so yeah i don't i mean the new baroness record that i worked on is those guys live like it's inspiring to see a band that can play and pull it off and have sounds that are incredible and still love audio you know they just it's not just about uh getting up and just jamming it's it's really you know thought out sounds they, they did a great job recording themselves on that record it's incredible actually awesome thank you for sharing that uh let's go to tanners and then we'll get john's question yeah i was gonna say if it's somebody else in with tanner then come all the way up to the mic so that we can make sure we hear you howdy can you hear me i can rock and roll um i just have kind of a personal question you've made it through the industry um i think it can kind of at least i see it to be it can kind of be a little bit of a pretentious industry um how did you navigate through all that pretentiousness I mean, you know, like, how do you like just positive and just like, you seem to have done that pretty well. So. I'm not always positive, man. I, I'm pretty much, I, I, you know, I live in LA, but I like to say I'm from New York because that's where I did grow up a lot. And um, in New York, if somebody sucks, you pretty much go, hey, man, you suck. And in LA, you kind of go, hey, I love you, dude. And then when they turn the back, you go, yeah, that guy sucks. So I've never been that guy, even though I live here. I, I'm pretty much, I'm a straight shooter. And I think that's how you, I mean, the only thing you're going to have, honestly, is your integrity. So you can't, you can't, you know, you, you have the control of your own integrity. No one takes that away from you. You're either going to bend over and be a doormat or, or you're going to go, no, I'm not going to do that. And I've always been like that, man. I mean, turn the vocal up. Okay. Turn the vocal up more. Dude, I don't even hear the band anymore. Okay, and it uh, well, I want the vocal up more, and I'm and I'm paying you. I'm like, go fuck yourself, pay somebody else. That's just me. That's I've always been like that. So it gets you in trouble. I'm not saying tell everybody to go fuck themselves, but saying if the situation arises and you need to, just fucking don't even think twice about it. Just have to be willing to do it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, John, go ahead. All right. Um were there any like uh things you did uh career wise you know as a self employed engineer where you were like man i am so grateful i did that or something you didn't do and it's like man i so wish i had done that i don't know i think if, if you go through life thinking about regrets you're going to just be a miserable bastard anyway so i my only real regret is not having a you know not taking time to have a significant other and you know i love kids and stuff i've lived my life through other people's i'm an uncle to everybody else's kid but um but i've always had to hustle to support so that that's the only regret i really have is not you know learning that part of fulfillment but um yeah i mean it's i don't know honestly just I don't really have any other regrets, you know, just not really sure how to even respond to that. Sorry, man. It's just, uh, you know, all good. Yeah. I'm the miserable type. So it's my bad. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, like, like, do you, and if you want to hang out with a person in a studio for 12 hours, you know, do you want somebody to be a miserable bastard or do you want them to be uplifting? But I also don't like the yes, man. Like, you know, you know, a yes, man. Hey, man, this is a great, a great jacket you're wearing, you know, whatever. All oh, that does a really cool part, man. And, and people see through that shit, too. And if it's, you know, if it's not good, then why? I mean, this is not, this is not brain surgery. No one's dying over a shitty mix. But at the same time, it's if it's something that you don't believe in or something that you think could be better, I always tell bands the same thing, man. You just try to make it. You know, I might, it might be the greatest idea you ever had or the worst idea I ever had. I'm like, let's just try it. It might lead to something else, you know, and most bands are 
cool with trying stuff and there are a couple that are just like no fucking way i'm never doing that and usually those are not the people you surround yourself with you you shared a story when i was down at your um studio about uh the commuting to costa mesa for that life is but a dream and how the guys in Vent sevenfold came up to your studio all the time and you were going down there and what was their demeanor coming up to you all the time and then you you caught yourself that i think this is a there's a great lesson to be learned in this those dudes drove hours every day and not one day did they ever complain about traffic or have like a you know a frown or anything they they were always like we're here let's do it and i drove to costa mesa and it would be like 55 miles and in la it might take two hours and, and just go what the fuck man this traffic is you know and that my my demeanor was Mr. Miserable and their demeanor was the opposite and and that that's a good lesson. Yeah, no, and and just because John, I think that helps uh kind of paraphrase that he said that like you you get in LA, you sit on the freeway because you're not moving very much, you sit on that freeway and you you gruel out to places and they're just excited to be in the studio and create their craft. And so there is the attitude like being grateful for what you're able to be able to do helps. And I think gratitude will always help you find a way to say, you know, avoiding regret is when you look I, yeah. at regret too hard. You, you're going to get depressed. Right. But if you can be gr grateful and gratitude towards the things that you have, you're going to avoid that pitfall. It really comes down to the glass. Is it half empty or half full? You know, if you're if you're if you're a pessimist the whole time, woe is me, woe is me. No one ever wants to hang out with you. But if you're like, hey man, the glass is half full, it might be a shitty beverage in there, but it's still half full. That I would rather hang out with that person. Yeah, Gareth, you got your hand up again. Go ahead. Yeah, a question came up that Joe, you kind of just hinted on, um, and I wanted to see if there was a little more insight on something that you said um something that i struggle with as a producer when i'm working with artists here in atlanta um is how do you how do you approach situations when you have a disagreement between like your taste on something and then the artist if the artist is like i think this thing is really cool and you're like i think this kind of sucks like who how do you kind of duke it out with the artist who who gets the final word or how do you move on from there when you kind of get stuck on a, a thing like that? I mean, how, how important is it to go fight for ultimately, you know, I mean, it's, it is their, their art and your help creating it. And so if somebody goes, well, I really like my vocal line and I'm like, well, I think you can hit it better. And they try to hit it better and it doesn't get better Then yeah, then we're cool. You know, I mean, in the end, it's like I said, it's not it's not brain surgery. No one's dying off of any of this stuff. It's just it's another interpretation. So but there are there are records that I've worked on. Where I'm just like, I'm obviously the wrong guy for this and I'm out of here and I'm willing to just go. Here's your money. See you later. Take my name off it. Whatever I got to do. This is not anything that I would like to be affiliated with or associated with. And, you have to be willing to do that because in the end you're creating it's you're creating a body of work that other people are going to hear and maybe hire you to do other work. You know, you write a book, somebody buys your book. It's a bestseller. They go, Oh, I've got to fucking hire this guy to write another book. It doesn't really work that way in the, in the book department, but this is sort of what we're doing. I mean, realistically. Um, so you have to have a body of work you have to be proud of. I mean, and whether whether it be whatever genre of music, if you're into all kinds of genres of music, then then you you do the best you can in every genre of music. But for me, it's always been pretty um pretty focused. But but ultimately, I mean, that's that's what it really comes down to in the end. I mean, you you pick your battles if it's worth leaving for. If you don't want to join the army, then then don't go. But sometimes you're just in it. You're in it to win it too. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. 
I think that's great advice. I think that we've picked up a lot of really uh, unique perspectives and we've gotten to see demeanor and character of who you are, Joe, and we really appreciate your time. We know that you're busy and you got to get off to work for the rest of the day. Um, but uh, we, Let me we see if I got any positive time. mix notes here. Hang on. I'm going to tell you if I got any positive mix notes or shit. Right. We're gonna, this we're is gonna... where it comes down to, you know, in the end, you're like, am I going to, in the end, somebody's judging you anyway. <laughs> oh, I got nothing. See, there you go. Nobody. There's some plugins on sale. Don't crack software. No, no, I got notes. nothing. No mixed notes. Dang. Well, um, if these guys want to follow you, are you cool with them following you on Instagram and chime man, you know, whatever, say a lot, rather email me. I don't really care. It's easier for me. Old guys like email. <laughs> I mean, I'm on Facebook in so long. People are like, Hey dude, your Facebook. I'm like, whatever. I don't care. Instagram's easier. Cause my dog can take pictures too. If you guys want to email Joe, Ask me. I won't say it on this because we'll put this out on the internet. So not everybody has to have your email address and you get a billion spam messages. But if you guys who are here want to ask Joe a question, I have his email. We I can get that to you guys. You guys can reach out to him. And uh, appreciate your time once again. Um, we'll be in touch. Thank and uh, thank you guys for joining us in on this call. And we will see everybody at another time in the future. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Thanks.